wide leap of questions. And uh, I know that both Ari and uh, Kate Clark had questions in the chat box from much earlier in our session. So this might be the chance for either of you guys to fire your question <laughs> now. Hi, I was, I was interested in, Andrew, the, um, the relevant forms of the hoverflies. Uh, I mean, you know, clearly they're an interesting group. Clearly there's not much work that's been done on them. So I mean, how do you assess how important they actually are? And of course they move like crazy too. So it makes it very difficult. But I'm just curious, hey, what do you thought about that? Particularly, you know, you said the parasitoids were, parasitoids were important. You mentioned rapey, of course, which we know is important from an aphid point of view. So, I mean, how do you evaluate something like hoverfly impacts given the, um, the issues around that very interesting predator? Yeah, uh, they are definitely a very interesting um, predator and hard to rear. I've tried to rear them in a glasshouse setting and I've failed, um, whereas ladybird beetles and wasps are a lot easier. Um, as Siobhan mentioned in his talk, like he's sort of focusing on the ladybird beetles over parasitoids because they do have a more direct impact. And like, I guess there's a bit of lag between a parasitoid attacking a aphid and the aphid dying. So there's, you know, I guess there's still potential for that aphid to vector a disease or, or something. Um, so in one sense, I would, I do like the idea of hoverflies over parasitoids for that reason um and uh, as i mentioned at water karen this year the, the farmer told me that he hasn't sprayed at all and last year he did was spraying but there was a big abundance of hoverflies and there were and that seems to have carried over this year yeah. so and i think hoverflies are good because unlike ladybird beetles um ladybird beetles are notoriously cannibalistic if they run out of food so that females aren't interested in small colonies the hoverfly adults, you can probably keep them in the field for quite a while because they're pollinators um, and you're sort of getting that double benefit. Whereas, I um, I mean, Diatorella rape might be a pollinator, but I'm not too sure. They're a lot smaller and I think a lot less mobile. Um, so, but that is a good question and it, I, I don't know how you would, uh, like it, more research is needed and I think hoverflies just need to be researched more in general. So maybe that's post- post-PhD. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I guess I guess I was wondering if you could do exclusion. I mean, you've got different size mm. animals, of course, and I just wonder if that's a possibility. The, the problem is the hoverflies are hard to rear in a glass house. Um, it's not hard to collect the larvae, actually, and rear them out. That, that's what I've been doing for my um, EAG experiment. So I collect them uh, from the field, from South Thistle mainly at, at this time of year. And I've got the uh, larvae, you just throw aphids at them, they eat it, then they pupate and you've got an adult and a bit of honey, you can keep them for a week, uh, about a week, I think, yeah. or longer. So um, yeah, pop should be possible. Mm. Yeah, but it's difficult because hoverflies are difficult to rear, so yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ari. Uh, Vesna, I just saw you just unmuted. Do you want to go next with a question? I just wanted to add to this um, that um, Klaus Birkhofer from Sweden has published um, maybe five, six years ago, a review on the methods, the way uh, that you can estimate uh, by control by different natural enemies. So maybe um, you can have a look and, and get some ideas how to quantify the uh, Yeah, that, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, the Swedes are good in this in this area. I know. Um, uh, He's German, Jake? though, <laughs> but works in Sweden. Work yeah, in Sweden. <laughs> they're all good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if, if you could send me that paper, I'd be interested in looking yeah, at it. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to Thank send you. it to you. Also, you had a question, didn't you? Oh, oh, that's the one I asked. Oh, you already you. answered. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Great presentation, too. Okay. Thanks, Vesna. That's a very useful contribution. Uh, Catherine, are you still with us? You might want to ask Andrew your question now. Better late than never. Um, I, so Catherine told me that she's heading off to the biosecurity one, but I did answer her question in a uh, private Thanks, chat. If you, do you want me to answer it? Yeah, why not? Um, yeah. Um, let's see if I can find you. Um, it was about how you came to select those particular volatiles for your lab. Yeah, she was... Um, uh, 
So interested to know how you came to selecting the volatiles to test in the lab. So my response is basically, I had hoped to use the volatile analysis to guide that. But in the end, I went to the literature and I looked at the volatiles released by Brassica napis, which is the most common species that are used for canola cultivars, at least here in Australia. And then I just sort of went through, look, which one of these are interesting, um, plus some, I guess, sort of random for it, because which is good because some of them come out as negative controls, like eugenol. Um, but I was, you know, looking at the green leaf volatiles and other ones that the literature had said were interesting. Um, I also looked at if it was common, if it was a volatile that was common across Brassica rapa and Juncia, which are also volatiles, uh, which are also species that can be canola cultivars. Um, and then obviously if, whether or not I can order them from Sigma, you know, uh, or if we had them in the lab. So it's just because I don't have that guide of the volatile analysis, it's sort of like what's practical and what's, uh, what looks interesting and then a bit of randomness. Yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, Andrew. Well, as a rider to that response, can I ask, uh, what about herbivore-induced plant volatiles? Are they on your radar screen? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, so green leaf volatiles are generally seen as herbivore-induced uh, volatiles. Um, and a lot of, like, I started my honours looking into this stuff and... Um, so yeah, so I, I didn't use that phrase exactly, but it's definitely a, uh, a group of volatiles that I'm interested in. So if in the literature, a, um, uh, you know, a chemical came up as an herbivore induced plant volatile, I would want to look at it. So, and that a lot of these green leaf volatiles fall into that category. And I think indole as well does as well. And that had a good response from the hopper flies. So, yeah. Thanks. Well, um, I'll, I'll just add for the interest of the, of the group, or at least those in the group who are interested in this uh, branch of uh, biological control, that some years ago I did some research on an approach that we called attract and reward. And the attract part, of course, was using herbivore induced plant volatiles, or at least synthetic analogues of those as a way to lure natural enemies into crops when and where you need them. And the reward part of that was to provide nectar plants to uh, maximize their um, residency and their performance as biocontrol agents. And to cut a long story short, we found that the uh, attract could be so powerful that many growers didn't bother rewarding them. It was just used as a standalone technology and if you walk into any branch of Bunnings warehouse, you'll see the product that resulted from that project. It's called Eco Oil. And so, yeah, just out of interest, have a glance at the label or the online brochure for that uh, product, Eco Oil. And it, and it will show that this uh, branch of chemical ecology really can deliver practical benefits. The, the product itself, I'm told, is uh, doing very well commercially. Okay. Um, now, uh, any further questions specifically arising from our talk this afternoon? I ask it that way because if there's not, then there's a little bit of unfinished business from yesterday's session. And I'm wondering if Umar, my co-chair, if I could possibly throw to you, Umar, and you might uh, help us segue into a brief discussion about yesterday's unfinished business. Yeah, um, thank you, um, Geoff. Um, so yesterday's discussion panel never came to an end because there was a question that was asked by Ari at the end of the discussion and um, people never got to respond to it. So maybe I can ask Ari to set the stage and ask the question again, and then we can open up for a discussion, if that's okay. Okay, no worries, thanks, Omar. Um, yeah, so, so the question really was concerning the situation where you get partial suppression of a pest. And, and the question was really about, you know, where you get partial as opposed to high levels of suppression. How long does it persist? I mean, do we have a situation where those sorts of scenarios are great for a little while. I mean, I think Dan made the point 
with respect to ameliorate control that it might be sufficient to produce control. But you then get, if you like, escape from the biological control exerted in those situations. And you know, there are a number of hypotheses that have been around for years about why you might get escape. And I'm really curious about what's what's the experience that people are having currently, and do we think this is an area that's worth investigating? So the question is where you get partial suppression, not complete suppression. You basically your pest persists, do you then get an escape eventually? For a number of reasons, such as the evolution of um, genetic variation that allows the pest to get out, or do you have a situation where a partial reduction can persist for a long period of time? And is it the case where you get much stronger suppression, do you then find that it persists for a longer period of time across the years? It's not a straightforward question. <laughs> No, I wonder who's been brave enough to take that one on. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting one because, of course, in the um, you know in the quarantine and and um, you know space that, that was considered quite a long time ago as well. Of course, you know the idea that when you bring in a beneficial from the outside, you know classic biological control, the issue was how established does it have to be before it takes off, before it persists, and um, it's it's an area that has been quite widely discussed in different contexts, including even, even dung beetles, right? And um, I, think, I think it's something that is really worth revisiting and thinking about. And I'm just, I'm really curious about people's experience in this situation. Well, I wonder if anybody within the group does have any immediate experience that might address that question. I can't honestly say that I do for my own particular projects, but I'm reminded, of course, of the uh, the reasonably recent paper from uh, New Zealand, uh, Steve Gawson and, and co-authors, in which they found effectively breakdown in the long-term biocontrol of an Argentine stem weevil, wasn't it, Ari? Um, and yeah, that, yeah, that was really, a, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was a really a wake-up call for those that were kind of assuming that a successful program in classical biological control that was yeah. delivering uh, strong levels of control of the target would be self-perpetuating and uh, it would be happy days forever. Uh, in fact, it's, it's now being shown, at least in that uh, particular system, that it can break down fairly quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure anyone's rising to your flight, Ari. <laughs> Ari, are you primarily yeah. thinking about how there's like sometimes population thresholds for like what you need your biocontrol agent to be at to control your pests? Or are you thinking about seasonal variation? Because we have things where, especially with parasitoids, how their compatibility with their pests, the development rate of the pest may like totally outmatch the development rate of the parasitoid within it. And so then it's now no longer an effective biocontrol agent in those seasons. And so there's, I, I'm not sure which aspect you're mostly. Yeah, so just, just so, you, so you're talking about seasonal changes, right? I mean, it's obviously important, right? Critically important, but we're thinking about situations and the example that Jeff gave is relevant to that, where basically you're getting a reasonable level of control, and it might even be just early seasonal control, right? And what happens is that breaks down over time. So if you come back five years, 10 years from now, then that's broken down. So how, I mean, how often does that occur? So it's really about saying, you know, it's a bit like when you think about pesticides, right? Pesticides are great and resistance comes along, they're hopeless. And, and of course, some of these soft chemicals can get evolution of resistance quite quickly as well. So in that situation, the control mix breaks down. But of course, the same thing could easily happen when you have a biological control element. Uh, so it's a little bit different to what you were just talking about, your seasonality, we're talking about longer term changes, but they can still be quite rapid. I think it'd be very difficult to test. And um, and the reason why we have so many successful businesses is probably because farmers keep buying and releasing them, these yeah. biocontrol agents. Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, Dan was here and I'm really curious about whether Dan has any, I still hear, I don't know if he's listening, but. Yeah. You know, I oh, well, I, I got, for some reason, I was unable to unmute for the last five minutes, but. Um, yeah. Yes, it is an interesting questions you've got, Ari, but I think they're incredibly complex, as you as you pointed out. And also, I would suggest that they probably almost, you know, they they differ from organism to organism, or from from um, you know 
any conflicts with biocontrol control agent and natural enemies or uh, pest and natural enemies that might be out there. So I'm, I'm not sure how I want to even go about trying to answer those questions. But my thought is that I, I, I suspect that particularly with weed biocontrol, we rarely would expect to get a, um, uh, a control, and I'm talking about something that growers would be satisfied with in a commercial, commercial world from, from a single organism. Would you be, agree with that? You know, I mean, I think mostly it's the, it's the combination of several natural enemies. Some of those will be natives that, that do adapt to this new invasive pest. And I'm talking about invasive pests, of course, because I'm talking more about classical biocontrol control here, plus possibly the additive effect of any introduced biocontrol agents, but that, that rarely we would expect one, particularly weed biocontrol situation to deliver. And, but that, but I would also argue that any reduction is is probably worthwhile. Um, again, from a, I'm thinking you know, in the commercial world, from growers who have to deal with these things, that anything that reduces the um, the threat or the uh, or the pressure from from a pest is worthwhile, and that it it's already also very much a dynamic uh, a dynamic environment where we probably don't just sort of release a biocontrol agent and think that's the end of the problem somehow. You know we. Yeah, I don't, don't know if I've answered anybody's question there, but I, I do think it's complex. I mean. Yeah. So, you, so Dan, you can't think of situations where something that was formally released has become ineffective after a while. Right? Become ineffective? Yeah. Not, not. I can't off the top of my head think of such a thing. Um, I, I guess one of the advantages of biocontrol is that they have the capacity to adapt over time, but that also applies in reverse. Mm. And, um, and so I guess it's inevitable that in time the host or the, or the pest may find ways of thwarting the biocontrol agent. And, uh, but also biocontrol agents have a, a capacity to, to uh, and particularly I think we see often, very often the case that natives after, a, I'm going to say on average, about two years it takes for, for native or natural, naturally, uh, you know, native biocontrol agents to, to learn to adapt to a new resource. So invasive pests are, are often catastrophic for the first year and pretty bad for the next year. But it's, it's, an, it's interesting how often after two years, we do get more and more uh, influence from naturally occurring or native biocontrol agents that have learned to take advantage of this new resource that has landed on their, on their lap, so to speak. Do you think we have a good handle on the nature of the changes that have happened in those natives as they've started to exert a greater control? Because that's the opposite side of the question, right? It's the flip side. Yeah, I don't think we have a good handle on it, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I've just popped into the chat box uh, some of the bibliographic details for that article I was struggling to remember details for uh, about Argentine stem weevil and how classical biological control of that, which had worked very, very well in New Zealand for decades, did break down. Um, yeah. I, I would just um, add to the comments we just heard, especially Dan, I think, Dan, you very usefully pointed out that um, yeah, Dan, Dan, you usually pointed out that um, one of kind of technology, and there's a stark difference between conservation biocontrol, where a single species of uh, agent is responsible for the vast majority of the mortality, versus perhaps a conservation biological control strategy, where there are multiple different parasitoids and predators. Uh, involved in suppressing the target pests and and the biological control is deployed as part of an IMDN strategy anyway. Now, I think in cases like that, it's a far more robust uh, uh, system. Okay, Angela, were you trying to come in there? Yeah, I was, can you hear me now? I think I still have a problem with my system today. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we actually witnessed a situation whereby a biocontrol that was effective in the initial years of release became ineff ineffective. 
over time. In fact, when it was released, it had a, about 75% reduction in the pest density. But over years, it seems that the plant became very adaptive to the insect and it continues to grow. And the pest or the agent doesn't have any control over the plant anymore. So they can actually adapt to the biological agents. And I think um, success in biological control depends on what the targets of the program is all about. But in as much as there is, um, it's not possible to eradicate the pest totally, but there should be a significant reduction. A reduction, whether in the density of the pest or the infestation of new areas over time. So the, so long, so the level there for that treatment with chemical or mechanical means doesn't cause that much. Then I would say the biocontrol is not effective. I mean, the agent can establish very well, but may not be able to be doing the job. So for it to be very effective, there should be a continuous reduction in the pest density, at least below the economic level even if it doesn't eradicate it totally. Can I ask a question now, Jeff? Please do, Dan, yeah. Yep. Okay, well, um, Angela, I'm assuming we're still talking about the heresia cactus and the mealybug um, work that you did. And my thoughts are that it may well be that the cactus has somehow developed defenses against the mealybug, but it's also very, very likely that the mealybug has become of great interest to some of our naturally occurring mealybug predators and, and possibly parasitoids. And there's, there's a wealth of them. You know, mealybugs rank high in terms of biocontrol. There's a lot of natural enemies that will tackle mealybugs and we have a, we have a, a wealth of them in Australia. So I would like to see maybe as a continuation of your work that you go out there and deliberately uh, try to spray out the mealybug for a start to see what differences um, you get with and without the mealybug to, to get some handle on how much it is reducing the population, but also more importantly, to, to use a disruptive, and they're, they're pretty easy to get hold of, a disruptive chemical, if it's possible, to exclude the parasitoids and beneficials as much as possible from the mealybugs to see if the mealybug then gets back to its former uh, capabilities. And I suspect you'll find that if you can eliminate a lot of the biocontrol agents, that the mealybug will indeed probably prove to be quite hard on the Herisia cactus again. That's my gut feeling. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dan. That sounds like a, an interesting approach. I wonder though if uh, it might be worth considering using some kind of exclusion cage. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, spray. Yeah, ex exclusion cage. Exclusion cages would be a great way to do it, especially given that it's a field environment and you probably can't get out there often enough to, you know, so yeah, set up a series of exclusion cages, maybe use some sort of disruptive chemical initially to um, exclude any beneficials that might be on those plants. And I don't think it'll be too hard to do. And I think it could be quite interesting. It, it, the study of the natural enemy, it was actually part of my program part of the studies I was supposed to do, but when we got to the field, we found out that they are so we have to exclude it as important factors that could be limiting it. So and such study, it was actually conducted so many years ago and found out that it's actually not having an impact in the population growth of the agent of the mealybug. So I think it's really not. Uh, we're just having a bit of trouble with your sound quality so, there. So the agent, uh, and the agent is not of the plant, lower than expected. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, Angelo, we're having trouble with your sound quality. So what, what I might suggest is that uh, if you want to pursue this a bit further in discussion with Dan, then you can reach out and uh, mm -hmm. uh, discuss it offline, so to speak. Uh, that I'm sounds sorry like a, about that. yeah no <laughs> we've been lucky so far with technology um, 
if I be reasonably well. All right, look, we are um, right at the very end of our allotted time. Uh, possibly there's time for a final quick question, if there is one. If there's not, then it's my, um, my duty just to uh, thank you all for your participation. I mean, I was really disappointed when I heard the Adelaide meeting wasn't going to go ahead face to face as originally planned. It's actually been quite good fun doing it online. Um, not as good fun as gathering in person, but it's been useful all the same. And we've had sufficient time in the program for some informal interactions like this. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, have further discussion with anybody kind of offline, so to speak, um, about anything that's uh, piqued your interest in, in what I've said. Uh, I'm sure other stalwarts like uh, Dan and Ari would be just the same. But look, uh, a big thank you to all of our speakers and particularly those uh, younger speakers talking about their PhDs or postdocs. I always really, really enjoy hearing these uh, new generation of entomologists and ecologists uh, talking so enthusiastically about their work. And uh, there's still so, so much to be done. Uh, you, you'll, uh, you're, I'm sure you'll come about a very successful career because there's no shortage of biological control related challenges awaiting you. But uh, on that happy note, uh, let me bid you a good afternoon and a goodbye and uh, so long for now. Yes, well done all the speakers. Thank <laughs> you.